I thought it was uh, appropriate that I would talk about Ada Lovelace um, because it is Ada Lovelace Day. Um, and you all know that it's the international uh, celebration of the achievements of women in science, technology, engineering, and maths because you're here. Um, but the first Ada Lovelace Day was held on the 24th of March, 2009. Um, and I had decided to hold a day of blogging about women in tech. Because um, obviously tech's very uh, male-dominated. I was working in tech at the time, fed up of going to conferences and not seeing women. And as I said earlier, a friend of mine suggested Ada Lovelace, and I did what any self-respecting person does and immediately looked her up on Wikipedia. And discovered that she was the daughter of uh, Lord Byron, George Gordon, uh, the romantic poet, and Anne Isabella Milbank, Baroness Wentworth, uh, who was known as Annabella. And Byron was kind of a bit of a difficult man, as I think we all know, prone to mood swings, sometimes violent. Uh, he was the original mad, bad, and dangerous to know uh, rock star poet. Um, Annabella, on the other hand, uh, was, was a very different sort of personality, uh, you know, very intelligent, very curious. Uh, she was educated by Cambridge University professors uh, in classical literature, philosophy, science, maths. She particularly liked maths. Um, but Ada was uh, just a month old when her parents separated, and she had no siblings. And like many other aristocratic children of the time, she was brought up mostly on her own. She would spend hours looking at diagrams, reading periodicals. Um, she became captivated by machines. And actually, by the age of 12, she had started to outline a design for a steam-powered flying machine. And this was some 14 years before William Henson came up with his aerial steam carriage. But Annabella was terrified that Ada would grow up and develop her father's uh, terrible poetic tendencies. So she had her daughter schooled in maths by some of the leading minds of the day. One of her teachers was Augustus de Morgan, mathematician and logician. And he was incredibly impressed by Ada's abilities. Had Ada been a man, he said, she would have had the potential to become an original mathematical investigator, perhaps of first-rate eminence. Another teacher, who would also become one of Lovelace's close friends, was Mary Somerville, the mathematician and astronomer. Now, Somerville had herself shot to fame in 1831 as the translator of the five-volume Mécanique Celeste by Pierre-Simon Laplace, published as Mechanism of the Heavens in the UK. Now, I actually got to hold one of uh, Mary Somerville's own copies uh, last week, and it is chock full of maths. It is a seriously heavyweight um, object. And it was Mary, actually, who in introduced Ada to Charles Babbage. It was 1833, and this would be a pivotal moment for both Ada and Charles. Babbage was a mathematician, an inventor, a mechanical engineer, and also an avid campaigner against street music. <laughs> Babbage had devised the difference engine, which was a mechanical calculating device, which he hoped would produce uh, large tables of numbers. Now, these sorts of tables, we're talking trig tables, log tables, these were really important for doing complicated maths. And the numbers in them were all worked out by hand, by computers, people who compute. And so they were prone to error. And Babbage, not a big fan of error, wanted to get rid of as much error as possible. So he decided he, to create this um, uh, difference engine. The British government were also pretty keen on the development of the difference engine, and they gave Babbage £17,000 to build one. Now, that £17,000 in, uh, in 1840s money, in modern money, that's about £1.7 Unfortunately, um, this was not a good investment, as Babbage never quite got round to finishing or building the difference engine. 
because he got distracted by newer, shinier, better ideas. The analytical engine. This would be a general purpose computing machine. It would be programmed like the Jacquard loom using loops of punched cards, and it could do complex calculations. Lovelace was fascinated by this analytical engine, and she became an expert on it. And Babbage said that there was no one else who was as well placed to prepare the descriptions connected with his calculating machine than Ada. Now, in 1842, Charles Babbage gave a lecture about the analytical engine at the University of Turin in Italy. This man, Italian uh, engineer and mathematician Luigi Menabria, took some notes, which he wrote up and published in French. Charles Wheatstone asked Ada if she wouldn't mind translating the paper from French as she was fluent. And so in 1842, Ada began her work. Her knowledge of the machine was far deeper than Manabria's, so while she worked, she just corrected a few errors as she went along. <laughs> then, when she showed her work to Babbage, he was absolutely delighted, and he encouraged her to add her own footnotes, as she knew the machine so well, and her footnotes tripled the original paper's length. <laughs> In these footnotes, Ada outlines several early computers, one of which was able to calculate Bernoulli numbers, and this was footnote G. Ada broke the algebra down into simple steps that could be calculated using basic mathematical instructions, so addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division and she prepared the instructions for the analytical engine, for the punched cards that would drive it. And although there are other sketches, earlier sketches by Babbage, the Bernoulli program is the most elaborate, the most complete, and it was the first published. And it's because of this that we think of Ada as the first computer programmer. It's easy to forget, however, that Ada was working entirely theoretically. The analytical engine, rather like the difference engine, was never built. So where modern computer programmers can test and debug and iterate, Ada had drawings and explanations to go on, and that was it. And even if Babbage could rustle up the drawings she wanted, it might well be out of date, because he was constantly revising his plans. Of course, Lovelace didn't work on her notes alone. She collaborated with Babbage. Letters flew back and forth. The Victorian Post was uh, actually quite surprisingly delivered several times a day. Babbage was living in London. Lovelace was living in Ockham Park, which is about an hour out of London. So they made use of personal messengers as well. Their letters were often quite short and quite terse rather like modern email. Uh, one just says, uh, return sheet, um, need card requiring new variable. They met to discuss problems, to go over the proof, to make corrections. Now, when Lovelace finished her first draft of Note G and sent it to Babbage, um, unfortunately, Babbage lost a crucial part of it. And so Lovelace became not just the first computer programmer, but the first computer programmer to wish she'd taken a backup. <laughs> she writes to Babbage, I suppose I must set work to write something better, if I can, as a substitute. The same precisely I could not recall. I think I should be able, in a couple of days, to do something. However, I should be deucedly inclined to swear at you, I will allow. <laughs> Once Babbage had the new version, he replies, I like very much the improved version of the Bernoulli note, but can judge of it better when I have the diagram and notation. Lovelace continued to refine her notes, often working 18-hour days, and in 1843, 
they were published in Taylor's scientific memoirs to great acclaim. Menabria asked Babbage to pass on his congratulations to Lovelace, and Michael Faraday told Babbage that the paper was so complex it was over his head. But Lovelace's real breakthrough wasn't the program so much as a major conceptual leap that she made that was really unparalleled by her peers. Lovelace realized that if the analytical engine could manipulate numbers, it could manipulate symbols. And symbolic logic is what underpins modern computing. Back then, it was an emerging field, and De Morgan, Lovelace's friend and teacher, was at the forefront of that field. Lovelace realized that the analytical engine occupied a completely different category to the difference engine. The analytical engine, she says, does not occupy common ground with mere calculating machines. But Lovelace's culture, remember, still hadn't developed a concept of machinery much beyond the automaton. This is a clockwork ensemble that mimics life, but it can only carry out a small set of predetermined actions. The analytical engine, on the other hand, could produce an answer that it had worked out for itself. Lovelace knew this ability to produce an answer that had not been programmed in first was absolutely groundbreaking. This meant the analytical engine could do more than just calculate really big tables of numbers. It could potentially create the kind of complex art that one saw in tapestries. The analytical engine, she wrote, weaves algebraic patterns just as the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. It would also be capable of composing music. If there were rules to musical composition and harmony, she thought, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity. But in trying to explain the analytical engine, Lovelace faced a huge challenge. The British establishment was not interested, quite possibly because they just burned through 17,000 pounds on the difference engine. <laughs> but even other scientists struggle to grasp the importance of this concept of this general computing machine. In fact, I think it's true to say that the importance of Lovelace's work wasn't recognized for 100 years until Alan Turing, the father of computing science, started to work on the first modern computers in the 1940s. Indeed, it was in his seminal paper, Com Computing Machinery and Intelligence, that Turing explores the question, can machines think? He also lists contrary views on his position that machines could at least imitate learning and thinking. And he discusses what he calls Lady Lovelace's objection. Lovelace had written, the analytical engine has no pretensions to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. Now that could be taken to mean that Lovelace thought machines couldn't learn. Turing graciously points out that the evidence available to Lady Lovelace did not encourage her to so believe that machines could be that capable. It's hard to know how Ada would have fulfilled her potential, how she would have developed her ideas. We know that she had an interest in electricity, but she would never get to properly investigate its, its properties. She died of cancer aged just 36, less than 10 years after the pr production of her seminal paper. Over the last 50 years, Ada Lovelace's vision of a general purpose computing machine that can create art and music has not just become a reality, it's become commonplace. We hold one in our pockets all the time without even thinking about it. Lovelace really was a woman far ahead of her time, and to me it's no surprise that she's become so popular as a figurehead for women in tech and women in STEM. So I think that it's uh, a great opportunity to wish Ada Lovelace a happy birthday, first computer programmer and Victorian computing visionary.
Thank you very much.